And what we will do is to do, take the test that is currently done in the laboratory and bring it out into the field. And the benefit of that is the speed to making decisions. So Bridge, counterfeit goods have been increasing. In the UK alone, 12,000 litres of fake vodka were seized. How widespread is this and who is it affecting? Well, it's global. It's not a new phenomenon. I mean, even in the 17th century, a farmer who would sell his milk, let's say he made one litre of milk, he would add water to it and then add chalk to thicken it up and sell it as two litres of milk. So it's been going on for a long, long time. The, the cases that you hear about today, uh, for example, the melamine in the uh, baby powder milk in China, that uh, killed a few babies and affected hundreds of thousands of babies. And then there are more, less well-known cases that take place as well. So for example, uh, the US banned honey coming in from China, and as did the Europe as well. But what happened was that there was an individual from Europe who decided to import the honey into China, sorry, into the US and into Europe through third countries. So it's very prevalent all over the world. And then of course the most recent case that we all talked about recently was the, uh, the horse meat instead of beef in lasagna. That involved 13 countries in Europe and it involved 28 companies. Very prevalent. What are the consequences of food fraud for the food industry on a whole? Well, if you take it at a company level, there was a, a study done by Hendrik and Singhai in 2005, and they discovered that if there's a public recall of food due to some sort of food fraud or substitution, then the sales were affected by 93%, the share price volatility was 13.5%, and the shareholders' returns versus the peers was down by up to 40%. So that's the financial implication of food fraud. But one can also look at the brand level and the consumer confidence in brands, which has a much, much longer lasting effect than the immediate effect of finance. And then of course, one also has to think about the employees that are within the company itself. There is a lady in the US uh, involved with manufacturing of Parmesan cheese who is likely to go to jail for one year and her company will be fined $150,000 as well. So there is a lot of impact uh, to companies in the food, with food fraud. And so consumers, uh, how are they being affected by food fraud? Well, in the worst case, death because recently there was a man uh, who ate at an Indian restaurant in the UK and the restaurant owner described the dish as being nut free but in fact he was using a very cheap oil which had peanut oil in it and there were some almonds in the ingredients as well. The man died the next day as a result of that food. He had a very severe allergy reaction to the food. So from a consumer point of view, death is the worst case. But of course, people are being cheated as well. And so if one feels that they're paying $30 for something or 30 francs for something, and in fact it's a cheap substitution, then the consumer pays through their pocket. And then if one looks at religious groups as well, so if there is, for example, in Islam, uh, one is not allowed to eat pork. And yet they have discovered in schools that pork was being added, this is in the UK, pork was being added to some of the pies and it wasn't meant to be. So the consumers are very, very greatly affected by food fraud for different reasons. So how can we tackle food fraud then? Well, the governments around the world are trying to tackle it by essentially introducing some very, very strict track and trace mechanisms. So the most recent example is in the United States. They've just issued the Food Safety Modernization Act. And what this act basically tries to do is to replicate what I call the aviation industry. So if there is an incident with an aircraft anywhere in the world, then all the records associated with that aircraft are frozen and there is a complete track and trace of every single component on the aircraft to its source. And so this FSMA Act is trying to do the same globally. So any company that wants to import food into the US has to be approved. 
Any exporter from anywhere in the world that wishes to export into the US will have to be approved as well. So Swiss Decode is going to play a small part towards that as well. And so what we will do is to support the laboratories that currently do DNA testing of food, of drinks, for authentication, origin and safety. And what we will do is to do, take the test that is currently done in the laboratory and bring it out into the field. And the benefit of that is the speed to making decisions. Instead of waiting for lab results to come back, the individuals will have results within 15 to 30 minutes and they can make decisions on the spot. And we believe that this will support the FSMA and all other equivalent acts around the world. Thank you for your time today, Bridge. Thank you very much for having me. That's all for today, but you can get the latest with the Dukas Copy TV team by downloading our app or by following us online. Goodbye for now. Oh,